I'm Dorothy Asher, by the way. <laughs> most of you know me. I think I know most of you. Um, so, so I have been the director for 36 years. And now I, I'm stepping down. I'm a actually acting as curator. And we did hire Kyle. And so he started about two months ago. And I have to say, he's doing a great job. Really, he's wonderful to work with. He has a great personality. And that's what we need in the museum world. We need people, people, people. <laughs> so uh, it's very important so that you're not just sitting behind a desk and you know, figuring out research or something like that. So Kyle has been a wonderful addition and I've seen him answer questions that members have or patrons and he's always able to field the question, so that's great. So I'm just helping him with the transition into the museum world and uh, something quite different from what he did in the past, but uh, I think he's perfectly capable and wonderful. So. I do want to introduce, we have a few of our board members here today. Um, they're actually all standing in the back for some reason. I don't know if you guys want to walk forward. <laughs> um, Charles Anderson, uh, Gina Nicholas in the center, and Winona Asher, she's actually my daughter. Um, uh, they are our, new, uh, our newest board members, so we're, we're happy to have them here. And <laughs> And um, I think that we're, we're ready to start. Kyle's ready? Okay. And then afterward, please stay for coffee, cookies, um, Arnold Palmer, uh, water. So please stay and, and chat for a little bit. Okay? Oh, thank you. It's been great. Can you hear me? Yes. Awesome. All right, well, uh, welcome all. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Dorothy. Um, you know, it's, it's been a really great transition so far. I'm really enjoying, you know, my time, learning a lot. Um, it's a real honor to be talking to you all today. Uh, nice to see so many familiar faces and a few new ones. Um, if you're here supporting the museum, that's, you know, that's an amazing thing. So um, my goal for this presentation is for you all to get to know me a little bit better, um, where I come from, what my background is, and then have time to, for some questions at the end. I'm going to start with my early background, undergraduate ed education, um, and then talk about my graduate studies in volcanology, seismology, and then end with what, where I was right before accepting the position uh, here. Happy to take questions of a clarifying nature during the talk, but if you have a really burning question about how a volcano works or why I made that decision, um, if you could hold those for the end, um, it'll keep me from getting off on tangents and get us all out of here pretty quickly. So um, again, thanks for being here. So um, I grew up in Elgin, Illinois, northwest suburbs. Uh, my gateway topic into both science and art was, uh, like many other kids, was dinosaurs. I was just talking to John in the back about some issues we may have with the, the Cretaceous diorama in the back. So very good, you know, after my own heart, for sure. Um, I was really lucky to grow up in a community that had resources like uh, the Gail Borden Public Library and the Elgin Public Museum, where I could explore uh, that dinosaur interest to my heart's content. I probably read every single book about dinosaurs in the library. Um, and I, I do have a very specific memory of doing a sleepover at the Elgin Public Museum. Um, and we, you know, we got, this was before the Night at the Museum franchise was going on or anything like that, but we, they had some activities. We, the doors opened, though, and I ran right to the foot of this giant T-Rex skull that they have on display and wanted to make sure my sleeping bag was set up right in front of the mouth because I thought that would be a great place to sleep for some reason. <laughs> um, I was really into the, the Land Before Time movie when I was about this age. Um, I didn't want to include uh, like the, a poster because we are putting this online too. So this is uh, the one piece of, of AI generated art that you'll see in, in the piece. I said two long neck dinosaurs in a forest and this is what it gave me. We can talk about that for days too, but um, anyway. Um, I also had, a, at a, I think it was fourth grade, I had an opportunity, uh, a really supportive teacher um, who uh, is, uh, heard that Dr. Paul Sereno from the University of Chicago was going to be giving a talk about paleontology at Fermi Lab, and I had really supportive parents who were willing to take me on a weeknight to go see this dinosaur lecture. <laughs> um, 
And it was one of the first times that I remember really thinking, hey, this science stuff, maybe this is what I want to do. You know, he, he came into it from an art background. You know, it was kind of all I wanted to be. So as I grew, uh, my taste changed very little. <laughs> um, I, Land Before Time did give way to Jurassic Park. Um, and then I discovered the Indiana Jones series, and I really thought that these figures of Alan Grant in Jurassic Park and Indiana Jones uh, as an archaeologist were just like the coolest, right? Um, so that was kind of where, where I wanted to be, what I wanted to be doing. Um, uh, I also became friends with Joe Lytle, um, and Joe introduced me to this really cool museum in Elmhurst that his great-grandpa had started. Um, where they had this great mixture of fossils and treasures, and it really hit all my buttons. So, you know, with this background, um, I, you know, I kind of was building into a person that I wanted to be, and so by the time I actually uh, was ready to graduate high school, I kind of had two goals. I wanted to either be an archaeologist or a paleontologist, and I wanted to go to Machu Picchu. It was in the cover of my Spanish textbook, and I thought, that's where I'm going, right? So Augustana College in Rock Island is where I had, really had everything I was looking for. Uh, they offered a study abroad program that did go to Machu Picchu um, and a strong anthropology program. And they also had a paleontologist on staff that had discovered some of the first uh, carnivorous dinosaurs in Antarctica. So I thought, this is amazing. However, upon taking my first paleontology class, I quickly realized that the work of doing paleontology was a lot less studying really cool ancient creatures and a lot digging, uh, more of digging through piles of bones, <laughs> discarded um, sometimes even by the side of the road. Um, I couldn't quite get excited about telling the difference between is this a fragment of rib bone, rib bone, is this a fragment of leg bone, how do you know? And that don't even get me started on having to identify sponges. Um, it drove me uh, in, insane. So. Uh, I crossed paleontology off the list pretty quickly, but uh, geology was did kind of start strike a passion in me. Um, each course I took was more interesting than the last one, and I, I kind of just kept going. I ultimately double majored in geology and Spanish lit um, with a minor in Latin American studies, uh, but I also like to say that my other minor was traveling. I took advantage of almost every exper travel experience that the college offered, and by the time I had graduated, I had spent at least three weeks on five different continents um, during my undergrad education. I did make it to Machu Picchu four times. Uh, I got to see the Great Wall of China, the Alhambra in Spain, and study elephants in West Africa. My geology studies led me to Ecuador and to Hawaii, where I first encountered volcanoes. The first volcano I ever saw with my own eyes was Cotopaxi right here. Um, you can see that from the capital of Ecuador, Quito. Um, and I was able to then go back and get a small grant for my undergraduate thesis, where I was able to visit three more Ecuadorian volcanoes, collect some samples, and do some trace element analysis to see how those volcanoes changed over time in their eruptive products. Um, here I am about 16,000 feet up on uh, Chimborazo, which is one of the, tall is the tallest Ecuadorian volcano. And uh, I got right to the foot of the glacier, but we couldn't go higher because I didn't have any ice climbing gear. Um, I wanted to, my guide wouldn't let me. <laughs> um, but then, so I, and, and we still had 4,000 more feet to climb. So Chimborazo, kind of interesting fact, is the farthest you can get from the earth, the center of the earth, and still be touching ground because of the shape of the, the earth. Um, so cool place to visit. Um, on a spring break geology field trip to, uh, to Hawaii, we were hiking to see um, a sea entry of a lava flow, and we stumbled, which is this one in the kind of the far lower right, and we stumbled upon a new breakout before the Park Service knew it was there. And so this was my first opportunity to kind of get it close, up close and personal with lava, poke it, push it, make it into stuff. It was uh, real hot lava. It was really, really fun. Um, and very addicting, I can say. <laughs> Uh, Augie also gave me a chance to feed my artistic side. Um, I got to visit uh, a lot of other ruins on some of these trips. This is uh, a pre-Columbian city of Chan Chan. Uh, it's a civilization that predates, uh, predates the Incas in Peru. Um, got to actually read and learn and kind of touch one of these uh, 16th century books that documented how water rights were first established in Peru. Um, it was part of my Spanish thesis for um, looking at how uh, water access shaped culture and perspectives in the Andes. Um, and I got to study abroad in, uh, in Africa for three months as well, in Ghana. We, here we are doing some uh, Adinkra printing with these different um, stamps that you make out of gourds. And then we did some kente weaving 
um, working with local art artists on that. Um, so I really got into the whole liberal arts uh, thing in college, <laughs> very broad based. Um, but after four years, you do have to graduate. <laughs> you have to figure out what you're gonna do with my life. So I knew I wanted to continue working in geology, didn't really know what, and I had a lot of other diverse interests. So how could I choose? Late one night, I'm studying for an exam in the, um, in the, for a structural geology course, and a guy who was a year ahead of me at Augustana pulled, was looking for master's programs, pulled up this one that had, you studied geologic hazard mitigation in Latin America, I was sold. And then I found out where it was. <laughs> now, now you might think that w with that lead in that I was terrified of snow or something like that, but really um, the, the idea of living in the UP was one of the only other things that I'd ever considered other than living in the Chicagoland area as a kid. Uh, I was introduced to the UP as well by the Lytle family. I uh, got to uh, spend a lot of time up there with them. And so this was a really a dream come true to be able to be at Michigan Tech. Um, the, the Peace Corps program allowed me to work with both my geology and my Spanish backgrounds to learn and to serve. Uh, the, it started with a year of coursework up on campus in Houghton, and then two years in the Peace Corps, another semester back on campus when you're all done to write and defend a thesis. Upon completing my master's, I had some now specialized skills, and a master's, one of my master's advisors got some funding to keep working in Guatemala, and I said yes to sign me up. He was very happy to have me, and so I also did my PhD research in, in Guatemala as well. Going a little back though, um, my first year on campus, I did uh, get to spend three full months uh, doing field work to learning, learning how to study volcanoes in addition to the kind of the, the books aspect of things. One of my courses included a two week field trip to the Cascades, where among other sites we visited Mount St. Helens. Um, and I also spent a month, uh, sorry, uh, two months in Mexico studying Popa Capital, which is uh, right outside Mexico City here. Um, with that kind of preparation, I was ready to head off to the Peace Corps. I was stationed in uh, southwestern Guatemala in a little village called Las Marias, um, which is right at the foot of a volcano called Santiaguito. I worked in the volcano lab observatory and then taught at the local school um, for two years, uh, mainly doing science or uh, environmental lesson plans to kids. So you might be asking why anybody would want to study volcanoes. <laughs> well, first off, if you can't tell by some of the pictures I'm starting to show, uh, they really do tend to create some of the most beautiful landscapes on Earth. So that's not enough to get you hooked. Um, they're also very useful. <laughs> um, so this, what you, what you can see right here, this is, ooh, sorry, I'm not supposed to move. Um, the taller volcano in the back is uh, Santa Maria. The shorter volcano is uh, in, actually in an erupted, eruption crater from 1902 from that larger volcano, and that's Santiago, the active one right there. Um, around this volcano are plantations, and they grow things like coffee for Starbucks, um, which is those red beans right there. Um, that's kind of their plant form, and then you have macadamia nut. Further down the slopes, you have bananas, um, so all sorts of different you know, wonderful crops that are growing on this fresh soil. Volcanoes are also really incredibly complex. They involve all three states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases, uh, incredible ranges of pressures and temperatures, and a dizzying array of chemicals. All of these things are interacting to really do the ongoing work of creation that's happening on this planet every day. It's pretty incredible. But they also cause destruction. Uh, when Santa Maria erupted again in 1902, it was the third largest uh, volcanic eruption in the 20th century, and it killed an estimated 4,000 people. Solving some of these complex questions can actually impact people's lives. To understand volcanoes, we need to establish some terminology really quickly. So we're looking at two pictures. Can anyone tell me what we're seeing? Lava, lava right? <laughs> Both pictures are lava, okay? We have lava from Kilauea over here on the left, and on the right is lava from Santiaguito. This is a basaltic lava, it flows really nicely. That's a really chunky, dacitic lava. Um, so what is lava made of? Why do we call it lava? Molten rock, yeah, it's melted rock. So why does some molten rock behave nice and flowy like this? easy to handle, easy to approach, fun to play with, and other stuff explodes. John, do you know?
Yeah. You said it perfectly. Three factors that I heard John say. Chemistry, what it's made of, pressure, and temperature. All these things kind of come together to play how things are working. So we're going to talk chemistry briefly first. If we took the whole Earth, the Earth's crust, smashed it up, broke it up into lots of little pieces, and isolated the individual elements, made little piles, the oxygen in the silica pile put together would be about three quarters of the weight. Okay, just those two elements. It's pretty incredible. Okay, in rocks, silicon, the, the element, favorite bonding partner is oxygen, okay? And the most abundant form they take is this silica tetrahedra, four sides. You have the three sides of the triangle and then a base, four, four hedron. Um, they get together and they're a negatively charged ion. Okay, these negatively charged ions float around and depending on what they bond with, it picks up a host of different types of rocks and minerals, okay? If you look at the other atoms listed on this, you can see that they're all positively charged, right? So aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, magnesium, those are the other big constituents that we find in the Earth's crust. They all can get there in, into these silicon molecules, attract, make new shapes, or silica can bond with itself, make all sorts of really interesting shapes. And this, why is this important? It's because in a melt, when you have melted rock, the, the amount of silica and the shapes that it's taking really affect the viscosity. Viscosity is just saying how easily or, some, or, or difficult it is for something to flow. So we're looking at different grades of motor oil and how they pour in this, in this situation, right? Um, so again, viscosity is a, affected very largely by the, the chemistry of the, of the melted rock as well as the temperature and the pressure it's sitting under. Um, and again, if it, just a quick aside, if it's underground, it's magma. If it's above ground, it's lava. So I might be using those terms kind of interchangeably, but uh, most of the time I'm studying it, it's still within the volcano. Um, depending on those different amounts of silica, you really can then differentiate between whether something's going to blow up big or flow down nicely, just like John was telling us. All right, so this photo is a, uh, of French volcanologists Katia and Maurice Kraft, um, who studied and made films of volcanic eruptions in the 70s and 80s. Um, they categorize volcanoes in a really useful way that I really like. They use red and gray. Um, and why I like this so much is because just by looking at a volcano, you can really tell something about how it might behave. Red volcanoes are hot and quick, okay? Relatively tame, though. Uh, the re the, 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 as long as the lava is flowing and moving, generally you know where it's going to go because you can see the shape of the hill and, and where it's moving. Gray volcanoes uh, erupt large gray plumes that sometimes go up in the air, sometimes more dangerously go, fall to the, the ground and, and race and, and, and burn things and hurt things, right? Uh, by the way, going back to the crafts, um, there's a wonderful documentary by Werner Herzog. If you haven't seen it, it's on Netflix. Um, the Fire Within, it's really a great one, um, and it kind of goes into more of this. Um, but the types of volcano I worked on in Guatemala were kind of at this intersection between gray and red, right? Most of the time, they were red volcanoes. They, you could actually see at night, it, the top of Santiago glows red. Um, the, they have a lava, that lava flow I was showing you is moving down. You can kind of see it uh, in the background there. It actually you know, descends the hill at different times and flows and moves much slower than the lava at, that we saw at Kilauea or that other lava shot was from a different volcano in Guatemala, Pacaya. Um, but Santiguito has been erupting like this for 100 years, right? Most of the time, it's predictable. People know where it's going to go. Fuego, which is another volcano that I did my PhD work on, has been erupting for 25 years. It, uh, Santiguito erupts like this about once every two hours. Fuego is popping off about every 20 minutes, okay? So regular, easy to know, and easy to fall in the background, okay? But sometimes, both of these volcanoes act up and really do some damage to the surrounding, uh, the surrounding environment. Bad things happen. So if we can figure out what the warning signs from these volcanoes are, what makes them, when they're getting more dangerous, we can really effectively make, make steps to making life easier for the people that live around them. So we talked about the differences in volcanic behavior, but why are there volcanoes at all on the surface of the planet? Well, the interior of the planet is hot, still hot, um, and heat is trying to escape out into space, right? 
the interior heat engine of the Earth drives something called plate tectonics. Plate tectonics is this fundamental framework of, of most of geology. It explains why mountains form where they do, where, why we see oceans where oceans exist, um, and most importantly for today's lecture, <laughs> why volcanoes appear on the Earth's surface. Volcanoes need melted rock to exist, and to melt rock, you either need to ri raise the temperature, decrease the pressure, or change the chemistry. This ring of fire that you might have heard about um, is really just a, a way to relate these, this large chain of subduction zones um, and melting centers around the planet and that circle the Pacific Ocean. Subduction zones are where one part of the Earth's crust is actually bending and pushing, sometimes being pulled, underneath another portion of the Earth's crust. As this old, cold crust just down into the Earth's interior, some of those chemicals start to burn off, start to refine themselves. And when they do, they are more buoyant, they start rising through the Earth's crust, and that's what causes this kind of volcanic activity that we see. Magma might melt the host rock, it might mix with it, it might push its way through, or it might just blow right through, depending on what the chemistry is that it's going through and what's in the actual melted material. Um, however, even when a pathway is established, this movement of liquid through the Earth's crust generates vibrations, okay? And this is where my research came in, is studying these vibrations, trying to figure out what they mean and what they're telling us. Uh, I'm gonna focus on Fuego Volcano for a second because that's where I did my work for my PhD. Uh, Fuego is part of the Central American Volcanic Arc, uh, formed by the subduction of the Cocos uh, Plate down in the, in the Pacific Ocean, underneath the North American and the Caribbean Plate. It erupts basaltic to andesitic lava um, and, and really has a, a kind of a high water content for, for magma to it, between two and 6%. Activity of Fuego probably started around 80,000 years ago and has at least four separate phases which are easily represented um, by each of those little peaks in the top. I'll see if I can point out there, but it's yeah, not really. Um, the volcano all the way to our, um, our left is Agua and Fuego is the peak right behind it. Um, why do we care about Fuego? Well, Agua's dormant, but, Fue but Fuego is within 40 kilometers of this uh, area of Guatemala City. Uh, has about two million inhabitants in Guatemala City, and uh, when Fuego is erupting, um, it can really cause some damage for very least air traffic, um, and in the worst cases, would actually be able to reach the city with ashfall. Um, so I mentioned vibrations. Uh, as magma makes its way to the surface, it's shaking the earth. Ideally, we'd be able to dig a hole and see what's going on in Fuego and just look, right? But just like, that's very destructive. So just like your doctor doesn't cut you open every time you have a stomach ache or some cough, we use instruments called seismometers that act as a stethoscope so we can actually listen to those vibrations. In your body, most of the noises that you make are very quiet, thankfully. We'd all be embarrassed if we were all making all these loud noises all the time, but, um, we can use these seismometers to listen to the very quiet uh, chugs and gurgles and, and belches that the volcano is making. So my work really went into classifying all of these different uh, chugs and gurgles, figuring out where they were, what they were telling us. Um, what I found out was that the conduit system in Fuego is most likely sh uh, shaped from a combination of intersecting cracks. Uh, these cracks kind of open and close like this into one another. So they open from this long, uh, the, on the long axis and then close. Depending on what's going on with the magma chemistry at any given time, uh, it can really affect whether those cracks stay open and make it re really easy for the material to flow out, get out, or close up, seal up, and that keeps pressure in. We don't want pressure building at a volcano. The more pressure it can store up, the larger uh, the eruption's gonna be and the more it's gonna be um, hurting things. Um, so as the magma is rising, it can get caught at these constriction points. Uh, as these minerals are forming, you can really build up some of those constrictions. And so if we're looking at what's coming out of the volcano, not just the chemistry, but the actual minerals that we're seeing in some of these things, you can see changes over time, very minute changes. And by monitoring that, we can know when we need to pay closer attention and when we can just say things are going, going easy. This works because Minerals melt at different temperatures and pressures, right? So we have an example here where we have a, some 
uh, wax, some plastic, some nails, and some glass. If you heat it up for a, while, a little while, about 30 minutes at 60 degrees, you might be able to melt the wax. 120 degrees for another 60 minutes, now you're melting the plastic, and things start to mix together, right? As you cool down, you can start grouping those minerals into one another uh, and, and, and organizing them. And this is what's going on in that neck of the volcano. You're having some of these minerals find a perfect temperature and pressure condition to grow really quickly, seal that cap, and blow up. Um, incidentally, this is also, you know, what's, what the temperature, what the pressure, and what the chemicals available for are also what go into shaping some of our favorite other silicate minerals that we have at the museum. Uh, jadeite, which is a pyroxene, and, and nephrite, which is an ampable. All right, so after learning all that really fun stuff um, it, at Michigan Tech, I got hired as a postdoc at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. Um, I worked with Katie Karanen to study more volcanoes in Chile. Um, and I also got to teach some uh, graduate students how to use some geo do geophysical surveying in the field. Um, I again used seismometers to listen to the inside of a volcano, but this system was a lot bigger. Uh, Laguna del Maule in the Chilean Andes is a caldera system. Covering the surface of, the, uh, of this, this system is a beautiful lake, um, about three times larger in surface area than Lake Geneva up in, in Wisconsin. Um, but the lake lies within this giant eruption crater of the Laguna del Maule volcanic system. Uh, it's, it's a super volcano kind of along the lines of Yellowstone or Long Valley Caldera here in the US. <coughs> uh, from satellite and remote sensing, science and scientists on our team had detected somewhere between five and 25 centimeters of uplift, so inflation, so 25 centimeters every year for 10 years. Okay, Yellowstone doesn't do that. Yellowstone goes up and down a little bit, very quiet. So this was really, when people were looking at this, it was very striking because we were starting to get satellite data from all over the world and all of a sudden there's this big bullseye pattern saying something's going on here. So our job as seismologists was to put, again, our, our stethoscopes on the ground, listen and try to figure out if pressure was building up or if things were just moving around in a way that uh, weren't going to be so catastrophic. So instead of the 10 seismometers I used at Fuego, we had a network of over 30 to locate earthquakes, see where they were, uh, where pressure might be building. And based on the direction that the waves were coming from, we were able to figure out where they were and tell if rocks were smashing together or just moving past one another. Uh, right now, it seems like it's kind of business as usual for this system. No pressure is really building. Um, uh, but we have all of this information and we're in contact with the, uh, the team is still in contact with the uh, Chilean authorities that are, are working to actively monitor this and make sure that it's, it's staying kind of in a, in a background level situation. My advisor at Cornell told me that when I started that half the point of a postdoc is to get another job. Um, so I was thankfully hired as an instructor at Northeastern University uh, back here in Chicago. Uh, to teach geology courses. And I was really happy to be back in the Chicago area, um, back to closer to family, closer to friends. Uh, and I was very excited to be learning more about the region that I grew up in. I'd have all this experience elsewhere, but you know, didn't really know as nearly as much as I wanted to about Illinois geology. In Northeastern, I brought back uh, student field trips for introductory level courses for the first time since the pandemic. Um, I led a course teaching undergrads how to do ge geological and geophysical coursework um, out in the field. Uh, sorry, research investigations out in the field. And I started a trash can volcano uh, demonstration that I had inherited from uh, Michigan Tech, where we put liquid nitrogen in a bottle, cap it up, effectively make a little bomb, and then see how high it can shoot the water and the, the balls. And then we monitor it with a seism seismograph and uh, some microphones too, which is the same uh, machinery that we actually use at real volcanoes. So you can do some interpretation that way. Um, Unfortunately, this was, a, uh, this was an adjunct position, uh, which meant that I was continually looking for new jobs and new uh, way to kind of find something that, where I could know what I was doing for more than one semester at a time. Um, so I was doing a lot of uh, continually looking, applying for full-time positions, but I really was hoping to stay in the Chicago area. So again, when my friend Joe told me about this amazing museum that we had visited so often as kids, uh, was looking for a new director, uh, I knew I had to apply. Um, I was a little worried that I might not be exactly what the museum was looking for, but I really couldn't pass up the opportunity to reconnect with a place that is so foundational for uh, forming much of my direction in life. 
Being selected it has been such a great honor. Uh, I'm absolutely loving being here every single day. Working with the staff has been great. Um, learning from Dorothy is, you know, I'm, it's never gonna be enough. <laughs> There's always gonna be more that I'm gonna be asking her about. Um, sorry in advance, Dorothy. Uh, <laughs> um, and getting to see and work with this incredible collection uh, is everything I could have hoped for and more. So uh, I'm very much looking forward to being part of the next phase of this incredible institution you all have built here. And thank you for coming to this quick talk. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> All together? OK, so I, was, uh, I moved into the Quincy in January of 2000, 